Recommended by Who Do You Think You Are magazine and featured on BBC Radio. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time. Malcolm Hello everyone, thank you for being there and welcome to episode 29 of the Talk Genealogy podcast. You found it, the monthly podcast for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. How is the family history research going? You're not spending too much money on it, I hope. Don't forget, beware of the wolves. They are out there, seeking out opportunities to take our pocket money off us. Don't forget... The history belongs to us. A special welcome this month to new listeners that we seem to have picked up during the last couple of episodes. I hope you're going to find something interesting in tonight's go, and please let me know if there's a subject that you'd like me to cover. Our topic tonight, the history of fleet marriages and the like. that's That's amazing. amazing! Hey now, you keep quiet until I pay attention at the back. I need to remind you that I am neither a professional nor an expert. I'm an enthusiast like you who has spent much longer than he should have done digging up his family tree, very often in the wrong place. And these podcasts are really no more than me sharing with you some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. And please, I need to emphasise that I am talking about ancestor hunting in England. What's the fleet marriage, Malcolm? It's a marriage conducted by an unlicensed priest, strictly speaking, in or near Fleet Prison. But the term has been generally extended to include any unlicensed marriage, especially in London. It should not be confused with the perfectly lawful marriages where English residents hop across the Scottish border, keep up a residence, it used to be for 21 days, and then marry outside the regulation of the English law. Gretna Green comes to mind. Actually, the Scottish option only really became popular after the law had been brought in that brought an end to fleet marriages. But more about that later. I've said before that the origins of the practice have a somewhat delightful irony. In our episode on marriage licences, I said that in the far-off past... A marriage was recognised once a couple had acknowledged the condition by pledging fidelity to each other in the public place in the presence of witnesses. However, the church and the state told the people that God wanted them to be married in church. Accordingly, they issued licences, charged fees, recorded each wedding, and made them a public matter both before, during and after the fact. Now, some people had good reasons to offend the church and the state, particularly if they were underage or already married or out of sorts with their families, but they had no wish to offend God. So, they found a priest who was willing to perform an unlicensed wedding. In 1833, John Sutherland Byrne published his History of Fleet Marriages. It was a bestseller in its own way, going through two editions in three years. But although he argued very persuasively in the book for the informal records of these unlawful marriages to be brought together and protected in a public record depository, In fact, most of his work in this respect had already been done prior to the publication. He was already, thank goodness, very influential when it came to the preservation of the parish chest. In 1831, two years before the appearance of the history, he was appointed Registrar of Marriages in Chapels before 1756. And by the way, 1831 was the year that he printed the register of the English church in Geneva from 1554 to 1558. Now this isn't to say that Byrne's prior achievements detract in any way from the influence of his history of the fleet marriages. 
It was certainly an influential book. It was part of Byrne's lifelong campaign to raise the public's awareness of the heritage hidden in and sometimes hidden by old coffers. Now before we get going I want to offer a little bit of context. In episode 10 I spoke about the work of J.S. Byrne and did include just a couple of minutes on fleet marriages and I promised a more in-depth look into the subject and well 19 episodes later here we are. Then in episode 20 I looked at marriage licences and it was while I was preparing that talk that I realised that we needed to give over a whole episode to the history of marriage and more importantly the marriage records in England. Now however I approach that subject it's bound to be a bumper episode. And I don't like doing parts one and parts two because that sounds like cheating on the audience. But by producing a full length episode on marriage licences and another now on fleet marriages we seem to have cleared the ground a little for the general episode on marriage records and that will be coming up. Well that's the idea anyway. I hope that shows what we're up to and where all this fits in. And if you want to get the most from tonight's podcast, I do suggest that you follow it up with a visit to episodes 10 and 20 if you've not already listened to them. I'm afraid that I'm going to spend much of this evening's talk dampening down the fires. As Byrne's work was so successful that many modern day genealogists misinterpret its reach. I will be saying that the era of the fleet marriage in the purest sense, and the purest sense of the like marriages, was actually quite a narrow window. Probably less than a hundred years, and probably much less than a hundred years. And you know, it is unusual for a family tree to note a fleet marriage amongst its twigs and junctures. Now, let's say at the start that many perhaps most genealogists won't agree with everything I'm going to say tonight, but I'm basing my comments on what I've found through many years of working on family trees. However, I do want you to, to listen to others. Now, an important paper was published in 2008 by Probert and Darcy Brown. It's from the University of Warwick called The Impact of the Clandestine Marriage Act. It's a well-argued article uh, that follows the line that I support, that while these marriages were popular in London, it's wrong to think of non-compliance being spread right across the country. TalkGenealogy.blog Here is the website that supports the monthly podcast for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. You'll find links to previous episodes, a full list of books mentioned in the series, one or two details about other genealogy work I've done, and every now and then, though more then than now, a bit of a blog. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. Let's start with something of a recap about John Sutherland Byrne. He was an English solicitor, born in 1798, qualifying in 1819, and it was while working in the city districts of London during those early years as a solicitor that he not only developed an interest in parish registers, but he made their survival, integrity and recognition his life's mission. I have already mentioned his early posts. In 1836, he took up the secretaryship to the Commission of Inquiry into non-parochial registers and that kept him busy until 1841. In 1846, he edited what some sources considered to be his major contribution, the history of the French, Walloon, Dutch and other foreign Protestant refugees settled in England. Now, bearing in mind the strong historical tradition in England of weddings without a cleric, 
when can we say that the fleet managers specifically got going? Byrne doubts that it was a common practice before 1670, although he does acknowledge a mention in a letter that survives from 1613. In truth, it seems to have always been with us in one form or another. However, it seems that it was the suspension of Adam Elliot from the church in 1686. He was suspended for three years for conducting a marriage in his church at St. James Duke's Place without bans or marriage license. That discouraged regular and proper priests from neglecting the bans or licenses, but persuaded their more shady counterparts in the fleet to step forward. After several rather lukewarm attempts to cull the practice, the Hardwick Marriage Act of 1753, it became effective in 1754, offered transportation to anyone conducting a clandestine marriage, and that really did knock the game on the head, although some registers continue as late as 1770. So the window, as far as genealogical inquiry is concerned, is actually quite narrow, something like 65 years. Now, I do need to emphasise again that I'm offering something of a minority opinion here, you may prefer to take notice of folk who insist that the span was much longer. Tonight I'm wanting to sharpen up our understanding of the history, and more specifically the surviving archives, so that we'll be in a better position to assess any suggestion that their marriage was lost in the fleet. The fleet, by the way, was an old river, a filthy, disgusting city stream, where Fleet Street now runs, more or less, and there stood, many years ago, Fleet Prison. Fleet Prison, the source of all the rascalry, not to say ribaldry, and not to say confusion. The marriages sometimes took place in Fleet Prison, more often outside, and even more often in the many nearby taverns. The Hand and Pen in Fleet Ditch, the Fighting Cocks and Bishop's Blaze in Fleet Lane, and probably the most famous of all, Sarah Barrett's house near Fleet Bridge. Here is a published advertisement, a handbill, for a fleet marriage. At the True Chapel, at the Old Red Hand and Mitre, three doors down from Fleet Lane and next door to the White Swan, marriages are performed by authority by the Reverend Mr. Simpson, educated at the University of Cambridge and late chaplain to the Earl of Rothays. NB, without imposition. You know, it's almost as good a London portrait as a Hogarth engraving, isn't it? The Reverend Mr. Simpson was in fact Peter Simpson, one of the many colourful characters that we'll meet as we tread up and down the fleet. Should we better call them rogues rather than colourful characters? As well as acting in the fleet, Simpson also performed marriages at the notorious Mayfair Chapel near Hyde Park, especially between 1750 and 1754. Probably the most famous of the priests, if we can call them that, was Dr. or John Gagnon, who worked for more than 30 years in the area. Another was Walter Wyatt and his brother William Wyatt. Mr Wyatt, Minister of the Fleet, is removed from the two Sawyers, the corner of Fleet Lane, with all the register books to the Hand and Mitre near Holborn Bridge, where marriages are undertaken without imposition. Byrne describes things this way. The fleet parson and the tavern keepers in the neighbourhood 
fitted up a room in the respective lodgings or houses as chapels. The Parsons took fees allowing a portion to the pliers, etc. And the tavern keepers, besides sharing in the fees, derived a profit from the sale of liquors which the wedding parties drank. In some instances, the tavern keepers kept a parson on their establishment at a weekly salary of 20 shillings, while others, upon a wedding party arriving, sent for any clergyman they wanted to employ and divided the fee with him. Most of the taverns near the fleet kept their own register. Now if the fleet seems an unsavoury neck of the woods, there is a far more notorious area known as the Mint. Here was the King's Bench Prison, where a smaller number of marriages were conducted, and the Savoy Chapel, which really belongs to the last generation of the clandestine marriages, but advertised hard to quickly establish a reputation for convenience. The Mint, an area in Southwark, Known for beggars and thieves and rowdiness, it offered sanctuary to all sorts of villains. And if you want a colourful description of that area, I recommend a book by Peter Brown called Shakespeare's Local. Then there was Mayfair Chapel, initially near Hyde Park Corner. This was another venue that did brisk business and comes in second only to the general fleet. Registers, though incomplete and often small, survive from all these places. The numbers of these marriages might seem incredible to us. A busy priest could be doing 30 marriages a day. Probert and Brown suggest that 3,500 marriages took place in 1720 and 5,500 in 1740. Now these numbers have prompted some writers to assert that as many as 30% of marriages across the country were unlawful during those years, the mid-17th to the mid-18th century. But you know, that simply doesn't match the experience of most family history nuts. Certainly, the practice would have been more common in London, if only for the convenience, and in some cases, economy of the facilities. Sometimes the participants interest in the marriage was, well, curious to say the least. July 1729, the 11th. John Roger, gentlemen, and Elizabeth Hussey, alias Rebecca Mitch, both of St Margaret Westminster, widow and widower, paid half a guinea total. Mrs. Hussey, though a Quaker, none of the best scrupulous, she could not comply with the ceremonies of our church, yet would take a man to bed to her upon the bare dependence of a credit of a fleet certificate, she being only personated by Beck Mitchell. Hmm, my word. For tonight's retrospective, we're going back to episode one in this series, and the world of the Tudor wills. The recording is still available, so let's take a listen. Work from the original document, and the first thing that you want to do is make your own transcription. Now, you do this, as I'm sure you know, not by transcribing word for word. You transcribe letter by letter. And once you soon get the hang of it, it'll become very easy. They may be able to show you the sleeve or wrapper that the person who originally accepted the will put it in before storing it. We can hope that this too will provide a useful date and perhaps, if we're lucky, a snippet or two of other information. And we should look at it for any indication of whether your ancestor was following the old religion or the reformed religion. For example, any mention of the Blessed Virgin Mary is likely to indicate Catholicism. Once we have listed the inventory, we will be able to look at our evidence and make some interpretation about the ancestor's household, 
his lands, his business, and his family. As I say, episode one is still available, and you can track it down through the website. Now, back to tonight's episode on fleet marriages. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. Hardwick's Marriage Act scuppered fleet marriages and made the Scottish option more attractive. It was in the 1770s that Gretna Green marriages became more popular. Gretna Green itself was helped by a turnpike that had been opened. But there were, of course, many other towns which were just across the border and just as accessible. But were fleet marriages legal? Well, we are left with some confusion. After all, the couple had made vows to God. In some courts they were accepted as good evidence, but in others they were inadmissible. For me, they survive as evidence that when authorities make it difficult for two people to become a pair, they will find easier ways of doing it. Nature is a jolly good thing, you know. You just can't stop it. Actually, in the 19th century, it was decided that the marriage held good, even though the wedding itself had seen a felony being committed. That may seem quite a curious twist, but if you think about it, it was the only sensible way to go. So we can see the sequence. After the Restoration, the Church hardened its view about the publishing of bans and the granting of marriage licences. This led to some clergy being suspended, famously Eliot. In 1754, the Marriage Act reinforced this with the criminal law, opening the Gretna Green experience. And it was during the interims that provided the space occupied by the fleet marriage. What about the records? The priest often made some sort of record. In one example, this was made difficult when neither of the happy couple agreed to give their names. Plainly, God knew that they were married, and frankly, that's all that mattered. However, records were often made in the priest's notebook or journal mixed up with other matters. In another example, the priest made notes in his pocket book, but if the couple preferred to remain anonymous or untraceable, he kept them from the more formal register. Byrne, writing in 1833, was frustrated to find that many registers had found their way into private hands. But this proved to be a blessing, because those private hands were for helping them survive. Here's some earlier episodes of the podcast. Episode 15, Let's Talk of Graves, of Worms, of Epitaphs. Episode 13 was about the hearth tax. Episode 12, and it was Shakespeare, for example. Episode 9 discussed the medieval pipe rolls. Go to episode 7 for The Companions of William the Conqueror. Episode 2, The Herald's Visitations. And our very first episode looked at working with Judah Wills. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. Do you remember Sarah Barrett, who lived near Fleet Bridge? Well, here's her evidence from 1741. I knew Anthony Bushell. He's been dead for some years. I live in Fleet Lane. But the book this marriage is in belongs to Mr Cox at the hand and pen at the ditch side. I've got with me the registers of my husband's marriages. Mr Cox is dead and the book went to his widow. She has since sold it to other persons. Now, fortunately, the books were seen as being saleable items of value. 500 or more were sold by Mrs. Olive to Benjamin Planton in 1783, about 30 years after the Marriage Act. 
On his death, these passed to his daughter, who sold them to William Cox, and the government in 1821 purchased a collection from Cox. And so, through the efforts of Byrne, the Bishop of London, and the government, a good number, though far from complete, were brought into the possession of the nation. There were so many of these marriages that the National Archive now holds 865 volumes detailing, to a greater but usually lesser extent, 200,000 marriages between 1667 and 1777. Any questions or comments, any ideas or suggestions, you can contact the podcast through the website talkgenealogy.blog or through the Facebook page and there's Twitter of course on social media, just search for Talk Genealogy. What to do? Well, I would certainly consider other explanations for a missing marriage first. Now, there's a good subject for a future episode, finding missing marriages. But if you do want to turn to the fleet marriages, well, first off, assess the likelihood of there being such a wedding. The records are slim and are more likely to have survived for London marriages. You're looking for circumstances that would imply a hurried marriage, someone going overseas or on the run. Ages would be important if either bride or groom are underage or if you think there's ground for suspecting abduction then a fleet marriage would have been one option. The important thing was that no bans were read, so if there is any suspicion of bigamy, a fleet marriage, again, might be relevant. And look for grounds for family objection, the age difference, class difference. I wouldn't especially think that an early pregnancy is a common reason for a fleet marriage, because that this did not carry the stigma that it would do in later years. And what about the transient attitude to the marriage? In many cases, the people didn't seem to be taking it very seriously. It may be that they thought here was a marriage that no one would hold them to. However, for the genealogists, these registers and pocketbooks reveal a pairing which, though of dubious legality, may have produced children. Excellent pickings where to look. Now searching is going to be difficult because the people were not inclined to properly identify themselves so they might give their real name but then fib about their social status or their home parish. You may come up with nothing more certain than a probable rather than a definite find and it's best to understand that from the start. The registers are in the National Archive. Now we're quite lucky that some years ago Mark Herber uh, produced transcripts of the fleet marriages in three volumes, I think it was three, it may have been four, um, and those are now readily available on the second hand market, pick them up for a fiver, uh, or better still, go to your public library and remind them that it's their job to stock books like this and push them into getting some copies for their reference section. Sometimes our public libraries need to be reminded what their job is, don't they? Now, while I suppose the Herber option is the best way to go, I would use it as an opportunity also to explore other resources. I would first go to the Family History Society covering the home parish and see if they've done any project work on fleet marriages from their area. It's certainly the sort of project work that they should be doing. But tread thoughtfully. Whatever work has been done has been completed by volunteers. You may also inquire at the County Records Office 
they may have some fleet certificates, copies made from entries of the register. They crop up occasionally. Again, the CRO will know if any private scholarship has been completed and deposited with them. Oh, and don't forget the Family History Society of the Latter-day Saints. A look at their catalogue is often worthwhile. The Society of Genealogists in London will be able to tell you about similar private work in their possession. Also, fleet marriages is a very promising subject for a student thesis, so check for any papers downloadable from the academic sites. And even Burns History, downloadable free from archive.org, must include a few hundred examples from the registers. There is also an index by Prentice, but I have to say I haven't found it easy to track down copies. Of all those options, I think Herbert stands out as the most promising. Otherwise, we need to go to the source, and that's a discovery or search function at the TNA National Archives. Finally, a couple of stray thoughts. Don't rely on what you find. So many of the entries have the whiff of a fib about them. And if you do find an entry, then go further and learn something about the priest and the venue of the marriage. This is one of the most colourful eras in London's history, and an entry in a fleet register might be an attractive window to push open. Thank you for listening to episode 29 of the Talk Genealogy podcast. The next one up will look at what the family historian can learn from the life of Samuel Pepys, who wrote the diary. That is, unless I change my mind in the meantime. Goodness, that will be number 30. You know, we really ought to find something else to do. <laughs> hey, if you find that you've got time on your hands, start another index. They're great to compile and one day they might come in useful. You can house the cards in custom wooden cabinets. They polish up lovely. I've got scores of them around the house. I'm sure you'd be impressed. Goodness, the hours that I've wasted on them. As usual, my thanks go to Freeze Effects for the music and the noises, and Emily Brooks for the voiceover. You know what makes the fleet marriages so interesting to me? It's the discovery of those entries that are like little three-minute stories in themselves. And the characters are just scoundrels who run through this not quite... That's it. I hope we'll see you again. Good night and God bless. Here's your presenter, Malcolm Noble. Hello everyone. I'm taking time out just to record a very short series to support the release of my history about the plague in a Nottinghamshire village in 1604. In 1604, the Trentside village of Gleasley in Nottinghamshire was hit by the bubonic plague. It took off a hundred, give or take a soul or two, from a population that was, let's guess, a touch over 300. The plague in Gleasley. A Nottinghamshire village survives its summer of death. You'll find out more about it at plagueinbleasley.com. I've written myself a book. I guess the key words would be cricket, that's simple enough. Bingham, which is a town near Nottingham in England. And horseball, so taking together quite a narrow audience, which is why I've only printed a few copies. It's the history of four brothers who built the town's cricket team in the early 1800s. Their grandfather was my great time seven grandfather. So there's a touch of family history as we look at the tribulations of their farming furrows and their cricketing characters in Regency England. The Horse Bulls, Four Brothers and Cricket in Bingham. Ask wherever you buy your books, check it out through your local library, or contact me through my website, malcolmnoble.com. I'll tell you what, to make it easy, 
I'll make sure there's always a buy now on eBay. You know, so many cricketing histories treat these early games as curiosity of prehistory, and that really is. MalcolmNoble.com